Good afternoon. Nice for those of you who I haven't met, actually anyone in this room, I'm Joseph Clark, and as of this semester, I'm the chair of the CLA College Council. So on behalf of the council, welcome to our first town hall this semester. With that, I'm going to get out of the way very quickly and turn it over to Interim President Paul so she can speak to us on whatever she likes to speak to us about. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out here or uh, online, wherever you happen to be. Appreciate the, the opportunity to meet with everybody. And uh, really, I like to run these as a free for all. And uh, you just throw whatever questions, comments, concerns that you, you have at me. But uh, just, a, just a few things uh, I want to say, and then we'll just uh, uh, turn it over to all of you for the, the bulk of the time here. So uh, we all know, of course, that our uh, new president will be starting October 30th, uh, Dr. Mark Ginsburg is coming, in case you've had your head in the sand somewhere, uh, coming from George Mason University. Uh, you know, we're, we're excited. I think you're going to find him very personable, uh, very energetic, and, uh, you know, he's going to come in here and uh, do a great job. And so his intent, so he's been here, I've been working with him on the, a lot of that, that transition things, and, uh, you know, his his belief is that this is an institution going in the right direction, uh, but that so that he doesn't anticipate coming in here and saying, you know, this whole thing is terrible and let's go become a community college or let's become an R1 or something like that. I think he he believes that we're on the right trajectory, but of course there are going to be some things as he looks at everything with fresh eyes that he uh, will want to kind of push and develop as he becomes uh, president. But an important part of that is going to be outreach to the whole community, uh, <laughs> doing uh, things like this to hear from everybody around campus. So when those opportunities come up, I know that I, the plan is some face-to-face, -face, some just uh, collection online for people who don't want it or can't maybe make the face-to-face, -face, but having your input and uh, feedback and suggestions for uh, a new president is always really critical. So I just want to encourage uh, everybody to do that when that opportunity comes up. Um, one of the things we've been running around celebrating recently, if you, if you also haven't heard this, uh, it's college ranking season. And let's be honest, a lot of college rankings are nonsensical. Um, every year I get the thing that has me rank a whole bunch of colleges and universities that I have never heard of. And so they say, tell me about the uh, what's the perception of the College of Education at X university that I've never heard of? And somehow I'm supposed to uh, supply some insight that then will get matched and put in an algorithm and spits out who U.S. News and World Report's top universities are. So so everybody goes at these with a healthy degree of skepticism. And so the ranking that we're talking about a lot now is the Wall Street Journal ranking, where uh, Towson University came out as the number one public university in the state of Maryland, uh, number two only to Johns Hopkins. So that means that puts us up above everybody. And so when I got the news, I will tell you, I first looked at it with total skepticism. And I said, all right, yeah, so let's go see what we can find out about the methodology, because if I'm gonna go around and actually tout this thing, I wanna make sure it's not the nonsense that we usually get. And so I was very pleasantly surprised to look at the methodology and what they decided to do, which is a crazy idea, was to look at student outcomes for the first time. And so what they were looking at is less this whole idea of what your peers think about you. Uh, you know, US News and World Report has a big thing on your endowment. Well, of course, Harvard's gonna win that thing all the time in the Stanford's. And so it's a self-replicating thing. And everybody's heard of Harvard and Stanford, right? So a university like ours that's doing amazing things, we, we didn't have a fighting chance with those weird measures, but they're also weird measures. So what if, as Wall Street Journal did, said, what's your graduation rate? What's your retention rate? What's the economic mobility of students that you take and then graduate? What's your job placement rate? Um, what's your uh, student's ability to pay back student loan rate? All of these different factors that books on student success Put that in an algorithm and boom, Towson University jumps right to the top. And so that's a, so I'm actually genuinely proud of this ranking. And so you're going to see it all over the place and, and we're going to talk about it. <laughs> and as I like to say, when I'm talking about it, I go, Hopkins will come and be next, right? Um, because we're, you know, I, I just think it's a, it's a pretty cool measure. And um, 
the thing that's really important to understand is that I, of course, although I will, of course, take credit for it, have nothing to do with it. It's you all that are doing that hard work day in and day out. And that's why this is such a critical measure, I think. It's the fact that in the staff that nobody knows who the president or the provost is like when you graduate. They'll, they won't know my name, right? The students, they're not going to know that. You, you probably don't know the provost when you graduate, right? I didn't even know what a provost was. <laughs> but I can tell you all my faculty members. And I can tell you some of the key staff people who made a huge difference in my college career. I, I can tell you their names today, and I'm old. So this is why I'm super proud of this. It's affirming everything that we've been working so hard for so many years without the proper recognition out there. We've been quietly raising our hands saying we're awesome. And now here's some recognition. So I'm excited about it. Um, it's a testimony to, to all of your hard work, and I, I'm grateful. So, so you'll probably see that a lot. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, and really, I just want to turn it over to all of you. Um, questions you have, concerns you have. Um, I think, Teresa, are you monitoring the online thing? Yes. So it's a total free for all. What a rip. First question is always the hard. Yeah. So if this can just truly be anything. Sure. Um, one thing that I'm a new program director for uh, the clinical psych master's program. I just rotated into that role this year. Yeah. So I'm learning a whole lot of new things about the student concerns and such. Um, and one thing that was brought to my attention was um, that assistantships, while they are great in that they give out-of-state students the in-state rate in fall and spring, that doesn't carry for the summer. Mm -hmm. And so it makes, uh, I had a couple of students tell me just today that our, our program is such that the master's itself is 48 credits, but a lot of the students, the most of them actually wanna get to 60 to be licensed. Mm -hmm. And so if they were to take the four remaining classes exclusively over the summer where we try to offer them, it would cost them about $14,000 more is the oh, number yes. that I'm mentioning. Um, so I was just wondering, I don't even know like, where where that kind of uh, discussion comes in about if it's possible to have assistantships yeah. offer some type of coverage over the summer, just extend that in-state benefit to students, to grad students. That is great. That is literally the first time I've heard that. And so I 100% will look into that. So you have a lot more flexibility with graduate tuition than you do for undergraduate. And so um, so the undergraduate, the state has a, as a big, they have the thumb on the scale there a, a lot, but graduate, you have a uh, much greater flexibility. So let me look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about the status and the future of the art now. Where does it stand? What do we expect to be coming down in terms of timing? to have a new revised art document. And I only ask because it is, well, it's not the only reason I ask, but the main reason I ask is because it is having a bit of a trickle down effect on colleges and departments mm -hmm. and to not have that final revised document to you. So I'll, have, so I'll confess that I don't know what's happened since I've been running over in that uh, president's office, but I'll go back and look at it. I will say that, um, it's a, like a, been a nine year project or something insane like that, which just, um, it shouldn't ever have taken that long. Um, so it was my intent to sit down uh, with Cynthia Cooper. So we had grand plans for last January for uh, intercession that we're gonna sit down and just boom, knock it out. And then things changed magically last January. And so it uh, prevented me from being able to do that. But uh, it, it'll be something that, that I'm gonna give some uh, full attention. I'm gonna go back to the provost office uh, in in a few weeks. So, there, I mean, honestly, there's not no good explanation for why it's taking this long. Yeah, wouldn't it make more sense just to have that be like a faculty kind of run process? Um, I mean, get, it seems like there've been people who gathered a lot of experience over the years in all the different colleges. Get a bunch of people together. Maybe he's never do a great job writing stuff. Well, that's um, exactly what's happened, though. That's why it's yeah. taken nine years. It is a faculty-driven process where literally people are going line by line by line. 
And uh, my preference and my experience on this is that faculty have a lot of other things to do rather than sit there and go line by line by line. But you know who can is the provost office. And so what we should do is write something up for you all to affirm and comment on. That is way more efficient for all academic policies. So the art document, just to, just to be clear, is a fact, which is and should be and will be a faculty document. But the process itself, I think, was flawed in how we've been, I mean, clearly anything that takes nine years, I will tell you what, the US Constitution didn't take nine years, so here we are. So um, maybe it should have a little bit better. <laughs> I think uh, constitutional scholars out here. But I do think my preference on a lot of these things is, is you all have day jobs. My day job should be creating these things and then putting it out there and saying, you guys make it better. What are the things that worry you here? Um, we spent way too much time on this. And so uh, so that's what, that was where we were gonna try to go just to knock it out and get it done so that you know the academic senate can affirm it, uh, college council can affirm it, and we can make a, a better document much more quickly. So I think we'll probably get there. So, um... I, I I heard you say that you haven't been able to put your focus directly on this, and I hear that. Yeah. Um. So I was going to ask a question, but perhaps it's just a, a comment instead. Yeah. I just said, as one of the people who did the line edits, <laughs> um, <laughs> the line by line rewriting, um, I guess I would just respectfully ask that as much as possible, um, you try to keep the draft somewhat reflective of, of those efforts just because we did put so many years sure. so many hours please get it and gonna be respectful uh, of the process there's just uh there are some areas that i mean we could look at it right now and, and maybe because it took so long there's things that there's internal contradictions in a lot Absolutely. of different places and my guess is some people started and then dropped off and then somebody else and the other thing i'll say that is really apparent in our art documents is it wants to account for every exception <laughs> like every exception, every nuance, every little thing needs to find its iteration in this document. Whereas my perspective on policy is generally the shorter the better. Because when you think you're going to account for every exception, you're going to miss one. And now you're in trouble. Whereas you put the, the shorter, the briefer uh, policy together and then say, and then here's how you account for exceptions instead of iterating each exception. And so that's that's what I think, and this is it's throughout. It's not just the art document; it's policies all over uh, throughout um, Towson University. Where I say, well, how did that happen? Well, this one guy had this thing that happened one day, and so we felt like we better put that in policy. That's that's not how you do policy. It just that introduces error constantly. So we need to really look. So look at the fact of grievance policy. It contradicts itself probably four times in one policy. And you ask, how did that happen? And people will remember who've been here for a long time, well, there was this one person. Like, that can't that can't be how policy is created. So we just need to just go back and look at it. And again, nothing happens without the affirmation of fact about these. But simplifying, simplifying, simplifying is uh, <laughs> the best way to go, in my opinion. Yes. One question from online going back to our bragging rights. Yes. Is, is there a non paywall link to that rankings article? This person said, I literally had students not believe me about it. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you could read ours and trust it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's available through Pope, but yeah. if you want me to find out, I can do that. Yeah. Sure. All right. I would think so. I was thinking about that question about New York Times articles. Yeah. And, and you can through Pope get yeah. Yeah, I will find that out. Okay. Okay. But it's a Wall Street Journal. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. So, as an inclusion advocate and a faculty person of color, I'm curious what impact, if any, the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action has had on our efforts to diversify the battle. So, it's I mean, it's a great question, and we're gonna you know we're we're gonna see where where things go. But I I don't see. I mean, I think the Supreme and I'm not a Supreme Court scholar. So um, I, I may be wrong in this. I think that the Supreme Court ruling was more directly limited to recruiting college students and college admissions, right? It's most recent one. And so uh, so for us, this doesn't affect our recruiting whatsoever. 
And uh, and so I haven't seen anything that says we need to limit what we do uh, in terms of recruiting diverse faculty. So uh, fortunately, we're in the state of Maryland, which is uh, a little more sane on some of these issues. And so um, there's there's been nothing coming from our government. You're seeing all over the country, of course, governors putting in their restrictive views of of all these things, and we're fortunate not to have that here. So we're going to carry forth, and uh, you know, I think we're more than doubled on our efforts rather than restrict them for sure. Yes, yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Throw one out there. With events in the Middle East the last few days, as we move forward into an election cycle in this country, thoughts from your perspective on how we help a diverse, pluralistic community that is our campus to engage with these issues? Wow, that's is. a, such a small question. Thank <laughs> you for asking. It. Uh, you said they're too easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for giving me like, the, the really hard one. So, so look, I mean, this is uh, this is the uh, this is the obligation of a university, isn't it, um, to provide a forum, a place where uh, discussions of very difficult topics can take place. Um, I I say that as if this is an easy thing, and I know it's not, right? And I know particularly the issue uh, issues of the the Middle East are uh, areas with particular particularly um, strong feelings uh, around it. So, but I would say that my general notion is that we ought to be places where we can have reasoned discussion of very, very difficult topics. And the, the our role ought to be uh, in educating ourselves, uh, our students, uh, the greater public, um, because this is a, this, it's not going to go away. And sticking your heads in the sand is not going to be an effective response. And so what the format is, I don't know. Um, and you know, certainly we like uh we, we were talking about this down there. I don't know what that, that format is, what the right thing. And so uh listening coming from faculty, coming from students, um, I think that would be appropriate rather than me sort of dictating here, here, here's what we're gonna do. But certainly would welcome uh, the university to take some sort of uh, role in that educational. Yeah. So two questions, totally different topics. The first one is, do you anticipate shifting COVID protocols again with increasing rates on campus this fall? Uh, no, we we don't. So we have, we're, just a, as a reminder, we, we continue to follow CDC guidance. And so it, it, it's not in everybody's uh, face as much as it was in the past. But the rules still apply, uh, and this applies to students, faculty, and staff. If you you are obligated at this university, if you have popped a positive COVID test, to uh, report that report that uh, that you have positive, go home um, if you're able to. Right, with students, we're one of the few places we still have a, a little bit of quarantine space for students if uh, necessary. But if you uh, can go home, we have to ask students to go home. All, all the, the the protocols are still in place. So you, you know, you gotta be upon your being negative, um, not having fevers for your not forty eight hours, something like that. You gotta mask up for the next five days. So we continue to follow CDC guidance, and uh, that is all in effect. So we did send out at the beginning of the semester just a reminder to everybody these policies exist and pointed uh, to where you can find it on on the web page. So um, so if we haven't just throwing everything out. It's just, we're in a different place as a country. So I have a follow-up question to this before we get to the next question on a different topic. Sure. Students don't know the rules regarding reporting. Can there be a T3 communication or some other campus-wide update for reporting COVID? Um, sure, we can do it. Uh, um, like I said, we did, we did something out, uh, you know, to you today, I don't know if it's super effective, but, um, <laughs> Particularly with students, but we, you know, we can always over communicate. Uh, yeah. So, so I just want to say this might be something to remind your students in your classes as well, right? You, it, central messaging is really important, but then reinforcing that in your own classes, especially coming from you, the professors, I think that can have a lot of impact. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, we'll tackle it from both ends here. I think um, it's reasonable for us to send out a hey, we're, just as a reminder, we're getting, but mm -hmm. as the weather changes and people are in close quarters, so we'll, we can do something like that. Reminder that here's where you go for the workout. So, yeah. So, the final, was originally the second question has to do with youth events. Mm -hmm. What impact does campus violence, especially like what Morgan experienced, have on Telson's protocols? So, so we have uh, elaborate protocols, and you know, so it, this happened at, at Morgan State. Uh, unfortunately, it happened at uh, Bowie this weekend, but it happened at Towson University last year, right? And so let us not forget that um, we live in a world. Yeah, you know, I don't. Well, maybe it's gonna say I don't think this is controversial, but it probably would be controversial, so I won't even say it. But. Uh, <laughs> But it, I mean, it's a it's a sad statement that um, the cabinet has regular uh, tabletop exercises on how how we're going to handle it if this happens. What if this happens? What if that that scenario uh, is in in place? And so um, I will say that we have um, very significant protocols in place. Uh, the TUPD is uh, highly practiced in this area. Um, we work very closely with. Baltimore County Police uh, and our uh, <coughs> sort of surrounding this whole bunch of different jurisdictions, right? Right around here, they all, they all work pretty close together. Uh, we have all sorts of um, technology in place that is to reduce the potential um, of you know significant violence spreading. But this is this is unfortunately the world we're in, and it, the the most we can do is try to reduce, prevent, educate, all of the things we do as a higher education institution to work together to try to lower that temperature and try and try to knock it out. But there's we're not we're not immune to it. Um, and it would be foolish to think that we are. So but we have to the best of our ability, right? The technology, we've got the cameras in place. We have uh, you know there there's lots of them all over. We can read if if they um, Somebody does something bad on another campus and somebody catches a partial of their license plate or the whole license plate. We have license plate readers that will say, this car is on this campus or this car has gone down York Road and that will immediately activate things. We have the, the texting, of course. We've got sirens. We've got all, all kinds of things on, on the campus, which is just really a sad commentary on, on where we are. Uh, we're as safe as we can be in an open environment. In a country with the challenges that we face. Thank you. That's it. More line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, piggybacking on what Teresa was saying, um, before the pandemic, we used to have the police come in, and it didn't, and they would do the workshop, and it didn't matter what capacity you were in, you had to attend it. Okay. After the pandemic, kind of disappeared for the last three semesters. I have worked with the um, campus police, and at my request, they come in and do that workshop. Right. Okay, and they're happy to do it for anybody who wants them to come in. They're absolutely wonderful. Right. You know, but I would love to see, you know, um, that workshop come back, mm -hmm. and you know, at least once a semester, where everybody, no matter what capacity, to refresh yourself on what do we do, where do we go? I don't think that that's something we can take for granted, that we'll know what to do. That's why I pull them into my classrooms, mm -hmm. you know, but um, they're, they're always glad to do it. Matter of fact, they're coming in two weeks from now. Yeah, so, so you can, at time request, they will look, do this training for any, any group. So you feel like that's uh, appropriate? That might be one what, what they told me, not to interrupt you, mm -hmm. but I asked when, when I first recruited on three semesters ago, um, I asked what happened to that. And they I was told that the video that they have, they show over in one of the buildings, I believe it's administration, but I'm not positive, but they showed a couple times the first month of each semester. And it's a come if you want, don't come if you don't want. Well, 
that's not good enough for these kids, mm -hmm. you know, because if somebody doesn't make them do it, their schedules are so, they're so busy and running in so many different ways that they're going to say, oh, that's nice, but I don't have time. That's why I bring them into there. So, and the police and I have talked about it many times about trying to bring it back over here and the importance. Great. Questions or comments? Yes. So I asked a version of this at RPAC, but I'm going to ask it again yeah. anyway, because that's my way. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, given our move to R2, how do you see that affecting faculty hiring, specifically Towson investing in more tenure track hires, and what sort of standards or guidelines would you see for weighing the decision about whether or not to uh, award tenure track lines to a department? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So as part of the R2 plan, uh, as we've talked about, it's always uh, been recognized that you can't just go, hey guys, just do more research uh, and, and, and with the no extra resources. So we have been putting out uh, resources. Now we got a little gut punch with the, the pandemic and the enrollment drop that made uh, the original plan have to, to be delayed. But as part of the plan, the original plan had I'm going to get the number not exactly right. I'm going to say 60 new faculty lines as part of the plan, that those 60 new lines uh, would be distributed across uh, the campus, but not randomly. Let me say that. So it doesn't really make sense to just go, so 60 divided by 40 departments, everybody gets 1.2 people, right? And so that there was strategic investment in uh, some departments. But let me explain how the factory lines work completely independent of R2, right? Because R2 is one thing, you're, you're kind of invested in areas where you want some research and things like that, but also to try to get everybody's load down to, on average, a 3-3, right? If you're research active, your load should be a 3-3. So that was part of the calculation, that would, is part of the calculation of where you put new lines. So when a dean, so there's some weird myths out there, may not weird, because we haven't really communicated this very well. So there are some myths or misunderstandings about how you get, how does a department get a new tenure track line or how do they replace somebody who left or who is retiring? So the deans have, so we have a process in the provost office where all of the deans, every dean, doesn't matter what uh, college you're in, have to submit uh, the exact same data and the exact same requests when they're trying to either replace or get a new line. So what, what do they have to turn in? What are the student credit hour trends in that department? Right. What are the major trends in that department? Are there any accreditation issues in that department that would persuade to say, hey, even though you, this looks like they shouldn't need another for accreditation, they have to. Is there a new program that that department is had proposed or whatever that should be a consideration in getting uh, this particular line, and then the great category of other, <laughs> right? But everybody has to submit the, the same data. And so that's we use student credit hours to instead of majors as the biggest coin of the realm, because as CLA knows, uh, you all serve as a heck of a lot of students through gen ed. And so if we looked at just majors, that would not be an accurate depiction of what's going on in any given department. So we kind of uh, look at that, both of the things, the areas. And so that's how the deans, that's the data they have to submit to make a case for a replacement, a new line or, or whatever it is. And so if you imagine that, so it's 60 lines or something like that, it might be, I don't know, it's somewhere in that range uh, that we're agreed to, from, to be increased across uh, campus. We, we delayed that, the full implementation, because of the, the uh, drop in enrollment. But we haven't, we have implemented, we have increased the number of faculty lines. And again, I'm not gonna get this exactly right, but somewhere in the 20 to 30 range of new lines that have been brought to the university as part of this move. And so as you might think of it, some of these new lines have been, disproportionately placed in the areas that have a new PhD program. Because if you're going to do a PhD program, you know, you have to have a certain number of faculty who have those skills and that particular knowledge. And so that's that's where a lot of that 
early investment has come in. But there are plans to increase just across the board until we get to that number. I mean, we should be, when we look at across the board on a lot of departments, I mean, we should be able to get to that three, three almost without any new faculty lines for a very unfortunate reason, which is enrollment drop, right? And so if we're managing carefully our uh, departments and our assignments and who's teaching what, there are many departments that have already gone to a 3-3 or less based on what they have. So that's something I would encourage you all to talk about uh, if you aren't having those conversations. Um, you should be having those conversations. So to follow up, most of the requests that I've gotten from the chairs, I mean, it follows that most of the requests I honor, right, moving to the 3-3. Not everyone's at 3-3, and not everyone's requests, to be fair. But we've moved tremendously in that direction. Yeah. We have more work to do. Um, we will, my understanding is we will get one of those new faculty positions as part of the autism study right. PhD, and that will be next year's search uh, cycle. So we'll benefit that, but there are other ways to. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to have to relate a question that I've asked every year. Uh, I learned from Jennifer the answer you've asked. Um, <laughs> and that is about research money yes. um, for, for faculty as well, right? Like in our college, we get $1,250 into the News Parade Conference, which is the same it's been, I don't know. A long last time. Year, I well, right, right. right. It was a thousand before that. Right. Um, so, so I, you know, when is and I know it's not your budget credits. Um, it, are efforts being made in that regard as well to increase research funding for faculty, particularly I mean, not just grant money, but but basic research money. Yeah. So uh, so we have so two fifty doesn't sound like a lot, and I know it doesn't cover all that a lot, but multiply it by how many faculty you have. That's a lot of money at a university that's gone from 23,000 to 19,500. So we, so we have to be somewhat realistic about what's happened this year. Like people forget, I think like, you know, we, we're, out, we're mostly out of the pandemic and we think, all right, business as usual. We had a massive enrollment drop and we still have that massive enrollment drop and that's a huge budget hit. And so while there's a ton of things that we would love to be able to do and, you know, we're in this plan before a pandemic hit, um, we've had to adjust. We've had to be realistic about what we're gonna, what we can do. And so, while I would love to just go across the board and go, everybody in CLA, everybody in CUE, everybody is gonna get uh, an increase across the board. With the limited dollars we have, what we have done is said, all right, let's take a big chunk of money and put it into the faculty uh, research FDRC program. That was increased by five hundred thousand dollars. So that's not inconsequential. And so so while we would you know like to lift all ships, what we're able to what we are able to do with the limited funding is to try to be super effective with it by putting bigger pots into the areas where in fact you have high, kind of a higher need. And I mean by that, I want to take the summer to do this research project in Croatia or something like that. That in fact we are the best position to judge where we can put those investments. So that's why we put it into FDRC to let uh, faculty decide about faculty uh, research to increase that, that ability across the board. So, so that's where we put, for, for better or worse, uh, a lot of dollars into that. Um, and we've also increased this, for some uh, members of, of CLA, this will resonate, uh, startup dollars. We also put another $500,000 there to increase startup funds for faculty we need to create the labs and have that. Um, you're trying to recruit uh, a new faculty member, and they say, "Okay, terrific," but I need a, a lab that has X, Y, Z. Uh, we we increase those funds to make that possible as well. So, so there's been significant investment. It doesn't maybe look like a heck of a lot out of there, but uh, more than a million dollars towards faculty research when we've had the budget that we've had is pretty good. Uh, we're not done. Well, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so to piggyback off of the saying things repeatedly, this is actually not a question or a comment, um, yeah. but as we move ahead towards R2, uh, and I speak really just for myself and my department, I don't know about the others, we support, or I'm in psychology, I, I'm the program director for human resource development, mm -hmm. um, largest graduate program in CLA. 
we are practitioner focused. Our students aren't doing research for mm -hmm. the most part. Um, and so I I just want to remind us that that that's a critical piece, you know, that, that we're all supporting, but not getting that research support back from our students um, because we're training the people who are going to go out there. Right. The HR practitioners or clinical that's right. you know, psychologists. So don't forget about us. And um, maybe as you think about how you started off talking about perceptions of schools and, you know, so as you transition your knowledge to our new president of, of your perceptions of our colleges and our, and our departments, um, don't forget that that is a strength of, of us. And it's not right. captured in, it's not captured in more money for research. Right. Yeah. For sure. And so you're absolutely right. And so one of the things that, um, so I get, I always get asked about R2. It, it's just, and, um, and so therefore I have to answer about R2. And one of the things that I've always said is, it's just, a, it's a nudge, everybody, it's a nudge. Uh, it's not a transformational thing, right? Um, we're, we aren't asking everybody to go, whoops, well, I'm not, not now I'm not gonna worry about my teaching, I gotta do research. And, and we're not saying everyone's gotta suddenly write grants, right? We have already far more than exceeded the research expenditures we need to be in our two university, we, we tripled it in two years. So it's not a problem. That's not a problem. Everybody, congratulations, we met it. <laughs> so the only thing that's holding us back to being in R2 is that PhD students graduate. That's it. So so I think if everybody kind of gets gets that and understands that, that we were already there. And I've said this before and I'll say it again in the interest of repeating things, right? Guys, you can ask the same question. I'll repeat the same thing. <laughs> One of the things I keep repeating is that Towson University was an R2 in 2016. We were an R2 in 2016. We just didn't report it right. Otherwise, we would have accidentally been an R2. So if you think of what Towson, for those of you who were here in 2016, you know, I would not, but many of you were. Was your life shockingly different in 2016 than it was in 2015? Well, I'm younger. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be bold, man. I tell you what. So, so it wasn't. You would have act, we would have been an R2 if we reported correctly. So, so this is... What to my my point is, you are absolutely valued. You have to be a critical part of the university. And faculty who are not don't want to do this big transformation into research don't have to, right? We are fundamentally a university that seeks excellence, right? That's kind of what the Wall this is why it started with the Wall Street Journal thing. Notice none of it had anything to do with your research. Nothing. It didn't have anything to do with your endowment, it didn't have anything to do with our research expenditures, it had nothing to do with it. It had to do with teaching, right? It had to do with advising. It has to do with what kind of academic supports we put in place. It has to do with do we recruit awesome teachers, right? Professors who are really interested in research and also are interested in teaching students. That's who TU's identity is. And we're not going to lose that with the whole uh, nudge towards R2. So I, I can't wait till the first one of these where nobody asks me about R2 at all. So let's make it a vow to try to, to see if we can do it next time. Because here's the next thing. What's the next big thing? What I think the next big thing for us to do as a university is to focus on our four-year graduation rate. That's our focus. I want to talk about that. I want to spend the next year talking about four-year graduation rates. Why? Because I think it's the actual metric of your actual commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's your metric. There's your metric. Because the thing that you have to do to increase your four-year graduation rate, make you an excellent university, and particularly we need to focus on DEI. We run around celebrating, and rightly so, that our diverse students have a six-year graduation rate that's the same as, and in many cases, above majority students. That's awesome. <laughs> that's great. Terrific. What's the four-year metric? It's not the same. And do we think as higher education institutions, not just to you, but across the country, that six years is the right measure? Who decided that? Do you guys wanna know who decided that? US News and World Report. So I've already dismissed them earlier today. I hope nobody out there is watching from U.S. News and World Report. <laughs> Next year, it's like Towson University ranks 1,300. <laughs> but it's not a good measure. Four-year graduation rate, we have got to double down and commit to that. 
And we've got to commit to looking at the, the very real gap that exists and why it exists. And here's the good news. So the bad news is there is a gap. And the bad news is that our four-year graduation rate is sub 50%. The really bad news is that that's good in the country. That's good in the country. We should all be appalled, right? So here's the good news. When I said, hey guys, in, in our uh, research area, what's the average? Like if we look at people who don't graduate in four years, how far off are they? And on average, it's two classes. Two classes. If we can figure out two classes, our four-year graduation rate is going to skyrocket. We're not going to charge students extra tuition, and they're going to get a job six months earlier than they would have today. So I'm going to ask the campus to figure out those two classes, and we're going to do it, right? And that has nothing to do with our team but it has something to do with being an excellent university. So there's there's my goal for the upcoming year or so. Yes, you look like you're giving me the hook. Is there one more question or are we? There's the last question. Uh, from oh, we're going there and then there, how about that? Back to enrollment. In terms of enrollment, how is our enrollment going at June? And is that program seen as strong enough to continue on? So June will continue on, we'll, we'll start with that. Um, Enrollment at Tune, it depends by program. So there's some programs at Tune are do, that are doing great, and there's a couple of programs that are struggling. So we, um, we've we decided that we we have kind of ignored Tune, not ignored, but we haven't put as much focus on Tune and uh, Shady Grove and Hagerstown in Southern Maryland as we probably should have as a, at a university. So we're gonna, we're gonna go out there, but so we've already, been out talking to Hartford Community College, kind of looking around to see how we might strengthen that relationship. So, so we know that we have to put greater attention out there. Um, so the short answer, it's not going away. Uh, we are gonna to look at how we might boost the enrollments there if we, because we think there are some opportunities. Yeah. So uh, the number of uh, first generation Latino students is the highest this year, right? I believe I, I don't know if it's virtual, but I know our our uh, Latino population is the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. And I, if the trend is that it's going to keep on growing, yes. Is the university um, uh, allocating resources to support these uh, these students so that they succeed in graduating in four years, and also uh, providing cultural opportunities, uh, opportunities to create community, and also opportunity to create uh, interdisciplinary courses or courses geared towards this population. So that's, a, that's a, a whole series of really uh, good questions. Okay. So there are, I know there's affinity groups within the student body that really specifically both, both the first gen and also to, uh, to the Latino uh, population. And so I know that those exist and I'm confident they, that they will grow. To the, to the question about um, academic programming, I mean, I, I would, you know, in a crafty way as administrators do, turn that back to this group and say that, look, I would absolutely welcome that. I think that this is a, a, a growing population for us and I'm happy to see it. But so what are the ramifications? Uh, what are, uh, what programs that might we add or lift up um, for that growing population? And then are there, are, are there greater support services that we need to put into place? I haven't heard that. Nothing's come to me that says we're having a, a problem over here. Uh, certainly, if there are things like that, absolutely open to hear it. Yeah, my thing is that these people come with, um, yeah, mostly by, by cultural and sometimes by bilingual. So that's a great resource to give them to waste. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sure. All right. So I think our, our, our time is short here. It, it, we, we need to encourage our faculty to vote for a PTRN referendum. So we're going to take a few minutes to push yes. the issue. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Have a good rest. <laughs>
Uh, hi, I'm uh, Martin Roberts. I'm from the Department of Geography, and uh, I'm the uh, previous year's president or chair of the uh, PTRM uh, College Wide Committee. And I am the current chair of the COA PTRM Committee. So, over the past two years, uh, we've been working on a series of changes just to sort of um, get down onto paper uh, some of the things that have we've changed in our procedures uh, over COVID. When COVID hit, um, there were a number of things that, that needed to change. Uh, we needed to have electronic portfolios, uh, voting online, deliberations that could accommodate online deliberations. And, and so a lot of these changes just, you know, sort of been languishing for a while and people are kind of hesitant to make changes to our documents because it's difficult. It's time consuming. So we, uh, we've tried to make all those changes. We also wanted to make a lot of changes to try and make the document more clear, easier to read, easier to understand, simple things that could be like, uh, you know, adding uh, uh, sort of like little, little headers to each little section so you can find in the table of contents where something is. My goal of all of this is that for somebody who's new or going up for promotion, um, it's kind of like a nerve wracking time in their careers. The more that we can do sort of spell out the procedures that we follow, the more fair the process becomes. And so we've tried to spell out all these things and get it down on paper in a nice, clear, understandable language. And so we'd like you to uh, vote in favor of these changes. Um, and more than that, if you'd be able to go out and just speak with your colleagues and ask them to do it. I think there's a few things um, that kind of get in the way of people voting uh, for these changes. One is, we haven't had a lot of time to sort of look through and digest this. I think there's also sort of a, since COVID, it's been easy for us to kind of like, maybe not for this group, but plenty of our colleagues who aren't here today, um, you know, sort of step back from all the going on, goings on within the college. And so they might not be aware of all the changes. And so unfortunately, apathy is one of those things that will help uh, defeat this. Uh, we need to have a certain number of people voting in favor and, um, of all the faculty who are currently within the college. And at this point, we're not gonna make that threshold unless we get a lot more people voting in favor of it. Okay. Okay, um, so I just wanted to give some practical context of what the process looked like this year um, because it was very much an imperfect process. Um, so we were originally, as you may all know, there's a three-year document review cycle. So every three years, every college and department is meant to revise their documents um, <clears throat> as per UPTR. And so last year was actually our year to do it. We were given um, an extension until this year because, you might have noticed my question, the art document had not been completed. And so we were given an extra year to do this in hopes that there would be an art document by the time we did when we sat down in September to do this, there still is not an art document as there continues not to be an art document now. And so what we were left with is that on September 8th, UPTRM sent us a document that laid out what the policy changes had been um, over the past several years that we were essentially, not expected, but asked, recommended to make those specific alignments with our college document, essentially to have our document simply reflect those policy procedural changes, exactly the things that Marty put out. Um, and so we made the choice again at the recommendation of UPTRM to limit our revisions to those alignments. So there are things in our document, at least theoretically, arguably that could be better, could be changed, that we as faculty might want it to be a different way. We did not take on any of those issues. Um, because we did simply want to bring the document into alignment for so that junior faculty could know with certainty what the expectations for them are. Um, and as we mentioned in some of the communication, nothing precludes us from doing more substantive revisions, things that would be considered changes um, next year and frankly any subsequent year until we're obligated again in the 10 year review cycle. Um, so for example, I know that there was um, a concern that was brought um, at least to some extent um, by chairs about a, an error that is in the document. Um, 
you are right. The, the document that we put up for a vote um, actually has sort of a, a, a remnant of a prior time. Those of you who've been here a while, remember that we used to have to review pre-tenure faculty every year, but then it was changed and we no longer have to review faculty in there. I'll give them a formal review and in, 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 uh, post the third year review. Our college document currently has the old language, not the new language from the art document. Um, that's simply an error. That's an error that is going to be corrected. We've already communicated with UPTRM. When UPR UPTRM gets the document, they'll simply replace the language with the language that is in the art document. So that, that is a human error um, rather than some sort of intentional policy statement. And so then I would just again reiterate what Marty said, which is that since we need not a majority of votes to approve the document, but a majority of CLA faculty. So it is, we need, at least, was it about 87? <laughs> um, yes, votes, I think, um, in, in order for it to pass. That's why we're encouraging everyone to vote. It is, of course, your vote. If you believe deeply that you should vote no, you're welcome to. That it's, it's, it's your vote to vote. Um, but we very much encourage everyone to vote because we need a majority of the faculty body, not the majority of voters in order for the document to pass. Um, also, full disclosure, it's not entirely clear what happens if it doesn't pass, because we will still be held to all of those same policy expectations, um, even if it doesn't pass. So again, I would urge you to vote and urge you to vote yes. Does so, anyone hear from the election committee? So we got the numbers today. We're, we're getting close. Yeah, we're very close. Right. Yeah, we're 74 yes, 15 no. That's what we need. And we're we'll about 87. Yeah. Right. Oh, so we're lucky. We're yeah, so. Uh, and it's only been a week, not quite a week. Yeah. Time. Right, we're going to have another week of the election. So again, I just encourage you to click it open if you haven't already. Put in a vote. We have a few more days. Maybe it's a better way. <laughs> it's really more like a few through, more the through the rest of the Through the rest of it. Can you explain the, the procedural change that you mentioned that that was an error, that was a remnant? Sure. So it, again, many of you might recall, originally, at least when I got here for many years, we reviewed tenure track faculty who were not yet tenured. Every year they had a formal review. That has been changed. What is it, like five, six years now that's been changed, where um, Tenure track faculty are automatically renewed in their third, fourth, and fifth years, unless it's stated before August 1st or something. So departments no longer have to go through that formal review process. The CLA language currently says that there will be a formal review with a written recommendation and votes, and that simply isn't the current policy. The art document accurately lays out that they will be automatic renewals. So we essentially just need to replace the language we have with the accurate language from the art document. And again, we don't actually have control, so we can't not do it. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I would, I would say that once we make those changes, I think that should be voted on as well. The the but chair of UPTRM does even, not agree. Even yeah. even right now, the chair. So first of all, thank you to the chairs for bringing this up um, last week. So I communicated with the chair of UPTRM today and at this moment he feels it would not require another vote because it was an editorial in his mind error um but he hasn't consulted with the committee so if it needs another vote they'll let they'll let us know and we can take another vote we'll follow whatever guidance they give us but it was really in the end an editorial error so um that that can happen when we're working with group we cannot determine on our own we can't undermine the university's policies. Right. So the, the our document supersedes our document, and we will be held to that procedure regardless. And we can use the exact same language in the college document as is in the art document now. Do we have questions or concerns? If we have an extension for this year, does this mean our next full review is in two years or in three no? Years? The the, the um, uh, review cycle resets, so it would be three years from now that we would be obligated to do it again. And to really just to be a little bit clear, this was supposed to be done two years ago. It was extended once COVID was the reason for it. So initially, 
So we should have done this two years ago. And, and it's part of why that error is there because we're five, six years out <laughs> from the last time we actually revised. And so the last time it revised, that was how we review tenure track faculty. It you know, simply no longer is. So please uh, yeah, ask your colleagues to uh, to vote and uh, let us know if uh, we have any other questions we have answered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, we can So first, I just want to say thank you for coming today and thank you for your great questions for the pro uh, for the interim president. I told her. The best attendance we have at the town hall is when the president and the provost appear. And you proved me right on that. So thank you. And before, in case any of you are going to take a meeting, you know, before five minutes or three minutes are up, we're having a, a reception afterwards. So please stop by and get something. Or is this the reception? That's the reception. Pop up there and get the reception. We didn't want the students to eat it. Except for they are. I want to just uh, go back to something that um, was raised with the president about research and travel funding. Um, it is very difficult to think forward about travel funding and increasing it. My goal is to increase it again next fiscal year. We don't get the final end of the year data until in two months into the new fiscal year. By that point, I've already approved people and paid people for their trips. It's not the, the times to change. Um, I will say I predicted very well for last year, almost to the dollar, what I thought would happen. But what's unclear is we have more people supported by the Dean's office for uh, presentation of papers at conferences um, than the previous years, but no increase in the dollar amount that was spent, even though I increased the amount per person that you're eligible for by $250. So just anecdotally, I've heard from people, some of that has to do, maybe a lot of it has to do with uh, more virtual conferences. So people have not traveled as much, but they continue to present virtually. Um, so I'm hoping next year we'll be able to increase that again. There is always research funding in two cycles through the Dean's office, and we could use more applications. Um, Elena Gadotti is helping oversee that. And um, uh, the information is on the website. So just take a look at that. We're happy to have more applications uh, for that. I wanted to um, say a couple of things. Um, well, first, before I go on any further, I think it's important to just stop for a moment and acknowledge what's going on in the world today and what's happened over the weekend and the tremendous amount of suffering that has happened. And some of us have personal um, uh, contacts or family members, friends in the Middle East and are personally affected by it. But I think it's always important to acknowledge and, and remember what's happening uh, in different parts of the world, especially tragedies, not just good moments. These are really tragic moments that we're uh, experiencing in the last few days. I want to say just a word or two about enrollment. So, well, I, I, I'm, I didn't have the final numbers at the welcome back, but we continue to do well. So our graduate numbers in the college are up six and a half percent. And that's um, in line with the increase uh, university-wide. Our um, undergraduate population was down slightly, about 5%. That's a little bit higher than in other colleges. But if you look at the credit hour production that the provost um, talked about, we're down only a bit, 2%. So we are really um, teaching you know, more than other, we're sort of teaching more gen eds and TSEMs than other colleges. Today, there was a call put out. I'm not sure which groups got that. If it was just the chair, I, don't, I didn't look at the two line. And if you look at the number of TSEMs offered across the campus, at least the first three uh, departments for CLA, it might have been more. It was significant. So these are big contributions. They do matter when asking for faculty lines. What the provost didn't, um, I mean, I'm sorry, what the interim president didn't say, um, because she probably forgot, um, is that we have 
a lot of lines frozen because last year, the budget, in order to not lay off people, um, academic affairs gave up half of its frozen faculty lines to pay that difference. So whether or not those will be able to frozen anytime soon, I don't know. That also slows down hiring. Uh, the, the, let's see, what else do I want to say? Check the, oh, I want to say something first about grant proposals. Grant proposals put out by members of the college increased by 50% last year. That number came to me recently as well. Um, and you can expect corresponding increase of 50% uh, of monies coming in. That includes internal and external grants, not just one or the other. And I, I want to uh, announce a really important uh, award we, we learned about last year. In the history department, there's a program you may be aware of, Human Rights and History. And they were notified last week they got a Fulbright Scholar in Residence uh, Award. This is the first one for, of that kind for the university. So it's a very important thing, very big deal. And it's for the 24-25 academic year. Uh, more details to come. Okay, but a foreign scholar will come to campus for a semester. And once we have those details, history and, and certainly Dean's office will share it, but that's really great news uh, for CLA. Um, then the last thing I wanna say is events. You know from your own departments, there are a lot of events, a lot of events, and they're really interesting. Can't get to them all, but if you look at the CLA Dean's page, there is a list. It reads much easier than maybe it did in the past. And it's very, um, there, there's something for everyone there. So I hope to see everyone at some of those events. I get to as many of them as I can. All right, we are over time. You can ask me questions at the reception if you have them. Uh, thanks again for coming. And remember, for those in the room, the reception is back there. So I'll come and hang out with them.